There are a lot of things on your face that get mistaken for acne, but not all bumps are pimples. And if you don't know what you're dealing with, you could be treating it all wrong. So today I'm going to walk you through the most common acne lookalikes, what they are, how to identify them and what to do about them. I'm Dr. Sam Ellis, and I'm a board certified dermatologist in Northern California, and I'm here to help you understand your skin and find products that work for you. That is why I created this channel. So if you like that type of content, make sure you're subscribed and you give this video a thumbs up. Before we get into all the things that mimic acne, but are not acne, it is important that you can identify run of the mill acne because that is going to be the most common type of bump that comes up on your face. And acne lesions can appear in a few different ways. Most commonly, you're going to see blackheads and whiteheads, also known as open and closed comedones. Blackheads are open comedones. They're usually slightly raised or flat, black, gray, or brown bumps on the skin. And whiteheads or closed comedones are going to be skin colored bumps on the skin. And often you see them intermingling with one another. You can also have papules and pustules. Those are red bumps on the skin. Those are papules. And then if they have a little white head to them with surrounding redness, that's a pustule. And that is a sign of inflamed acne. And then lastly, you have nodules and cysts, those deep tender bumps that can appear anywhere on the face, but most commonly appear on the lower face and jawline. And the most common places you're going to find any form of acne, whether it's open and closed comedones, papules, pustules, nodules, and cysts is going to be on the face, most commonly on the forehead, the nose, the chin and jawline. But of course you can also get it on the chest and back. We see that all the time. And acne has a variety of different triggers. And usually it's the interplay of those triggers that lead to a full acne breakout. It's your hormones, it's clogged pores, it's inflammation and it's bacteria. And when they get in the appropriate environment, and if you're genetically predisposed to get acne, that's when you break out. A lot of times people will strategize with their dermatologist or their primary care physician about how to treat their acne. But if you don't have access to a doctor or you're waiting to get into a dermatologist, there are certainly things that you can purchase over the counter to start healing your acne. Obviously everyone's acne is going to be a little bit different, but there are a couple things that kind of work for any type of acne or that can at least get you started. One of those is Adapalene 0.1% gel, which you can get at your local drugstore. I think people are going to be most familiar with the brand name Differin, but La Roche-Posay has a version of this as well. Adapalene is going to help regulate your cell turnover. So it's going to help clear out your clogged pores. It's also anti-inflammatory. It also helps with post acne marks like redness or brown spots. So it really kind of hits on all the things we want to be targeting with acne. Typically I'll recommend people start using this in the evening after they wash their face because it can cause some irritation. I usually recommend starting it every third day for a couple of weeks and following it up with a good moisturizer. And then as your skin tolerates it, trying to move towards everyday application. I also really love a good benzoyl peroxide wash for the treatment of acne. Benzoyl peroxide is antimicrobial, so it's going to kill off acne causing bacteria. And if you use it in a wash off form, it's a lot less likely to cause irritation for your skin. For example, I love the Panoxyl 4% benzoyl peroxide wash. You can just put that in your shower and whenever you're washing your face or body, do that first. Just be careful with benzoyl peroxide because if you don't fully rinse it off, it can bleach your towels or your bed sheets or your clothes. So you've been warned. But I also want to make a note here that not all acne is going to respond to things that you can just get over the counter. So if you're trying these things and your acne is not getting better, that's where seeing a professional can really help. All right, enough about acne. Let's get into the acne mimickers because this is where people really get tripped up. One of the most common things that I see misdiagnosed as acne is rosacea. Rosacea is an inflammatory skin condition that usually shows up in adults. I rarely see it in kids and it really manifests as redness and tiny bumps on the face. So it makes sense that it gets confused with acne, but there are a few things that help us identify it as rosacea. One, rosacea does not have any comedones. So you will not see whiteheads or blackheads with rosacea. What you will see is background redness, typically on the cheeks, the forehead, the chin, and then tiny red bumps or pustules. And sometimes this is also accompanied by being able to see tiny little broken blood vessels on the face and other symptoms like easy flushing. I think where I see this most commonly misdiagnosed as acne is in my patients that are in like their late twenties, early thirties. They're definitely at a stage in their life where they could be getting adult acne, but they actually have new onset rosacea. And sometimes they actually have both going on. The other thing with rosacea is a lot of times when people really think about it, they realize they have some form of trigger, whether it's heat exposure, drinking alcohol, spicy foods, certain dietary things like tomatoes or eating chocolate or caffeine. And 
That's honestly a huge bummer. As someone who also suffers from rosacea, my biggest triggers are sun exposure and alcohol, but it's really important to be able to identify those triggers because it is the number one way to reduce your rosacea flares. It's also really important to be able to distinguish rosacea from acne, and sometimes that's hard to do because there can be overlap because a lot of acne treatments like benzoyl peroxide, like topical retinoids such as adapalene or tretinoin can actually flare rosacea for some people. When I'm treating rosacea in my clinic, we are often using prescription topical medications as a starting point. I often will give them a compounded medication that has a couple different antimicrobial ingredients, metronidazole and ivermectin, as well as azelaic acid to help sort of exfoliate the skin, but also be a very gentle way to calm down redness. And we call that rosacea triple cream. Now, if you don't have access to a dermatologist, you can get some forms of ivermectin over the counter. It's actually found like in the lice aisle because we use it to treat head lice. So you can get 0.5% ivermectin lotion that way. And that can be a good way to start treating your rosacea before you meet up with a dermatologist. You can also get azelaic acid, not in a prescription form. Granted in a prescription, it's usually 15 to 20%. Whereas if you're buying it from Sephora or online, it's usually 10% or less. That being said, I have a little love affair with the Paula's Choice 10% azelaic acid. It is their best product by far. So you can try things like ivermectin once a day, topical azelaic acid up to twice a day. But if your rosacea is not responding, again, that's the time to see a dermatologist. We can prescribe topical things. Sometimes we use oral antibiotics. It's always a conversation about what the patient's goals are and how they want to treat it. Another really common acne lookalike is something called perioral or periorificial dermatitis. And honestly, bless TikTok because it's raised so much more awareness around this condition. Even just five years ago, when I was diagnosing people with perioral or periorificial dermatitis, they were like, say what? But now when I talk to my patients about perioral dermatitis, they're like, oh yeah, I've, I've heard about that. Similar to rosacea, when you have perioral or periorificial dermatitis, you're going to have red bumps showing up on your skin. And also similar to rosacea, you're not going to have open or closed comedones. But instead of those red bumps being on the forehead, the cheeks, and the chin, typically with periorificial dermatitis, as the name suggests, you're going to have dermatitis around the orifices of your face. So around your mouth, your nose, and even sometimes around your eyes. The other thing I tend to notice in my patients with periorificial dermatitis is it's not just acne-like bumps. Oftentimes there's also a little background redness, scaling, the skin almost looks irritated. Interestingly, we can see periorificial dermatitis in really young kids. So I see it in like four and five-year-olds, but you can also get it in adulthood as well. I see it very commonly in young women. And it's a little bit tricky to treat because one, we don't always know what causes it. Now there are some very common triggers like topical steroids, inhaled steroids. So if someone has asthma or they use things like Flonase to help with allergies, they're much more likely to develop perioral or periorificial dermatitis. But it can also be triggered by things like fluoride in toothpaste, certain flavorings used in foods like mint, vanilla, cinnamon, and it can be caused by just disruption of your skin barrier. So I've seen it happen when people go too hard with their topical tretinoin. And the tricky thing about it being triggered by topical steroids like hydrocortisone cream is that oftentimes people will notice a little rash on their face. So they say, okay, I'm gonna go to the drugstore. I'm gonna grab some hydrocortisone cream. And they apply that hydrocortisone cream and it calms everything down. And they're like, okay, good, treated it. But then with periorificial dermatitis, you get this rebound flare when you use steroids. So it comes back and then you go, okay, I'm gonna go in with my steroid again. And then it comes back and that is a hallmark of periorificial dermatitis, which is why one of the most important things you need to do if you're going to treat this is to stop all topical or inhaled steroids. Now, if you're taking these for allergies or for your asthma, of course, check with your doctor first, but we need to find other ways to manage those conditions if we also want to treat your periorificial dermatitis. And aside from stopping anything that's triggering that condition, I always recommend to my patients that we go down to very gentle, basic skincare. We take out all the actives, any exfoliants, anything that's meant to increase skin cell turnover, things like vitamin C, we're really going down to a bare bones routine with a gentle cleanser and a moisturizer. Now, if stripping your skincare routine way, way down does not work, that's when you need to see a dermatologist because that's where we can prescribe topical anti-inflammatories that are not steroids. And sometimes we even need to use oral medications like antibiotics. Now, if you're hearing about this periorificial dermatitis for the first time and you're like, I think that's what I have going on, I do have an entire YouTube video specifically dedicated to it where I have more photos, go into more detail, so check it out. Another condition that's kind of a mouthful to say, but absolutely gets mistaken for acne all the time is pitorosporum folliculitis, also called 
fungal acne. I think of all the conditions I'm talking about today, this one can look the most like acne, especially because you have bumps that mimic those closed comedones. You'll often see it on the forehead or the jawline, just lots of tiny little skin colored bumps and some of them being slightly red or inflamed. But something that's sort of a giveaway that this is pterosporum folliculitis is those bumps tend to all be about the same size. You're not seeing a ton of variability and they can have this unusual symptom of itch. Regular acne is not itchy. If you have an itchy face, you have to start thinking about other diagnoses. Unlike acne, which is due to clogged pores and bacteria and hormonal fluctuations in the skin, Pterosporum folliculitis is due to yeast organisms on the skin getting into your pores or into your hair follicles and causing inflammation. Folliculitis literally means inflammation of the follicle. And it's pretty typical that if you're going to have pterosporum folliculitis, also called fungal acne, it's going to be on your forehead, sometimes on the lower face and jawline, and often on the body. Like it's very common for me to see this on the chest and back as well. It's also why it's really important and when I'm teaching dermatology residents, so dermatologists in training about evaluating patients that when you're evaluating someone for acne or for a new rash on the face, that you also look at the rest of their body because there can be clues elsewhere. Pterosporum folliculitis is a lot more common in humid climates. That chronic moisture on the skin makes it a lot easier for yeast to get into the follicle and thrive. Also in hotter months, if you are sweaty, if you tend to be an oilier person because those yeast eat the oil on your skin, you're more likely to develop this condition. I think as a dermatologist, when I see pterosporum folliculitis, it feels fairly obvious to me, but I feel like a lot of people will come in if they've been trying traditional acne treatments, either over the counter or prescription medications and not really responding. In those cases, we usually need to introduce an antifungal medication to their skincare regimen. I'll often start with topical things like ketoconazole, which you can get in a 1% formulation over the counter as Nizerol shampoo. We have people use it as a body wash, leave it on for a few minutes and then rinse with every shower until everything gets better. And when it's not responding to ketoconazole or other antifungal washes like Celsin Blue or Head and Shoulders, those also can work, that's when we start thinking about implementing an oral antifungal medication. And I should mention for any of the things I've talked about, acne, rosacea, periorificial dermatitis, pterosporum folliculitis, these are all chronic conditions that people can tend to develop or can tend to relapse once you stop treatment. So often the goal with treatment is to get everything under control and then find some type of maintenance regimen so that it doesn't come back or doesn't flare as often. Okay, I've got two more acne lookalikes and these ones aren't really rashes or redness on the face. The next two things I'm gonna talk about are individual bumps. Number one is sebaceous hyperplasia, which is essentially overgrowth of the oil gland in your skin. This creates a small, slightly yellowish bump, and often you'll see a little dell or indentation right in the middle. We typically only see these in adults. They're much more common in people who have oily skin or sun damaged skin, and you're somewhat genetically predisposed to getting them. And they're never going to be misdiagnosed as acne by a dermatologist, but for a patient who has a persistent bump on their face, they often think it's a pimple that's just not going away. These aren't going to bleed, they're not going to be painful, they're not going to grow rapidly. You don't have to do anything about them, you can just let them be, but there are cosmetic ways to treat them if you wanna get rid of them. In my practice, and I think what's most common and what most dermatologists use is something called electrocautery, which is just a little bit of heat electricity that sort of zaps that sebaceous hyperplasia and kind of melts it to be flat with the skin. But keep in mind, because this is due to an oil gland overgrowth below the skin surface, even if you melt it down, it usually wants to grow back or come back a year or two or three years later. So oftentimes if you have some sebaceous hyperplasia bumps that are bothering you, you may need some maintenance to keep them in check. And then my final, but also most important mimicker of acne is a skin cancer called basal cell carcinoma. If I have a patient who has a history of sun damage, who's maybe like 40 or older coming into my practice and they're saying, Dr. Ellis, I have this pimple. I've had it for several months. It's not going away. Maybe once in a while it bleeds. I'm not sure if it's getting any bigger. So often that is a basal cell carcinoma. When you look really closely at a basal cell carcinoma, oftentimes they look a bit pearly. You may see some little blood vessels running through them, but it can be really hard to tell, especially in the early stages when they're teeny tiny. Most often we are going to see these on areas of high sun exposure, like the nose, the cheeks, under the eyelids, on the ears, but they can appear anywhere on the body. 
And of course, it's really important to be able to identify these because this is a skin cancer. It needs to be removed. I don't expect any patient to be diagnosing themselves with skin cancer at home. We have lots of tools and good lighting in a dermatology office, as well as a ton of training to be able to identify these. But if you have a bump on your body, especially on your face, that's been there for a while, that maybe has a few little symptoms like bleeding or even just not going away, please, please, please get it evaluated. And if you have more questions on skin cancer and how to identify it, I have an entire video that not only talks about basal cell carcinoma, but also the other types of common skin cancer that you should be looking out for. Ultimately, when it comes to any of the conditions I've talked about today, knowing what you're dealing with is the first step in being able to treat it effectively. Have you experienced any of these skin conditions and what helped you the most? If you learned something from this video, make sure you're subscribed to the channel and you give it a thumbs up. As always, thank you so much for being here and I'll catch you next time.